percent warning, and I do, I say, okay, my my the red light has gone uh, basically it's gone down to let's say seven percent, right? And my battery red light comes in at ten percent, so I recharge it until it goes to fifteen percent, and then I take the <coughs> wire out. Alhamdulillah, battery is good. There's no more red light. Yeah. So take it out and I'm using my phone. Then I see after a little while it's gone back to red light again. So I put it back in, plug it in this time six percent. I plug it in, it goes to like fourteen percent, sixteen percent, and then I plug it back out. Alhamdulillah, batteries, batteries charged. Is it charged or is it not charged? Did I charge it or not charge it? Tell me. Did I charge it or not charge it? What's the answer to that? Yes, yes I charge it. But did I charge it enough or not? No. no. That's why it keeps on coming back to the red again. Right? Some Muslims are always in this state. Some Muslims are always going through this. They, they, oh my God, things are, let's go for Juma, they come for Juma, let's go for a couple of salahs here, one salah here, one salah, let's quickly uh, connect it with some bayan, some lecture here. So I've done my, let me give a bit of sadqa. They're charging, not charging fully, come back down. Charge, come back down, come back down. And they're always staying in that red zone. Up above the red zone, slightly, and back down again into the red zone. Up above the red zone, back into the red zone. When Allah Azza wa Jal wanted us to charge ourselves, He didn't want us to charge ourselves a little bit. He's asked, He said, Uzkurullah, remember me, dhikra, this is maf'ul mutlaq. Maf'ul mutlaq means that it's, it's, you remember Allah a great remembrance. That's the, that's the translation. And then Allah has said, kathira, abundantly. So after emphasizing the dhikr once again, the, the remembrance once again, Allah says, now there's extra to do. And after saying kathira, he says after that, وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا Say subhanallah in the morning, say subhanallah in the evening. So Allah first, first has said, remember. Then he has said, a good remembrance. Then he has said, abundantly. Then he says, morning time. Then he says, evening time. Allah is saying, keep it charged. Would it be not good, my brothers, that we have our batteries charged at 100, at 90, at 80? Yes or no? Yes. You have a charge of that, and after that, you know, if it goes down slightly, it goes down slightly, but keep it towards the hundred. Yes. If you keep it charged all the time, your battery is fine. You know, your phone's fine. You can you can use it as best as you want. The same way Allah has told us to keep ourselves revived all the time. And unfortunately, we've forgotten the power of our iman. So you know that our iman has got a wonderful power. I'm saying this in the house of Allah. If you want to find the power of your of your iman, you've got to use it in the way the believer has been told according to the Quran. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> if you have a diesel car and you go right down to right down to um, the the bar goes right down to the red. <clears throat> I don't know if some some of you guys know about diesel cars, but it goes right to the red and it's like you're hearing bottom zero. What what could happen to you, to the car? What could happen to the car? Stop. Well, it could stop, stop, but before that, in a diesel car, there's something different. Some air can go inside. And if some air goes inside, you've got a real problem. Because then you're going to have to take it to the garage and you're going to have to fix your car uh, at, at, some, at some point. Because you've now damaged the car. The same thing, let me give you another example. If your, if your tire pressure of your car if it goes all the way down to literally almost flat and you're driving it, what happens if it goes flat and you carry on driving it? What happens then, Tamil brothers? You damage the tire. You damage the tire. You damage the tire. There comes a point where if you don't... One is to keep it inflated. One is to keep the engine oil and the oil, petrol, diesel, whatever inside there. But another thing is that you take it to a certain point where it actually will now damage the actual substance itself. The same thing, my brothers, my sisters who are listening, the same thing Allah Azzawajal has given us, this Iman, what happens is, when you get to a certain low point, if you stay in that low point and you carry on grinding yourself down, then what will happen is that the reverse happens. The reverse happens, which is, you're a believer, you're a mu'min. And you're trying to make amends with yourself. The only way you will find yourself coming back to Allah, unfortunately, is going to be through a crisis. 
Allah does not like to hurt the believer. Allah does not like to hurt the believer. But Allah Azza wa Jal, just like the tire, you're going to now hear the grinding of the tire. You're going to now damage the, the, the application you've got because you're not doing anything about it. You will find damage to yourself somehow. Something will come around that will wake you up. You know, if you're driving and you're falling asleep. Yeah? They did a good thing where they've got, you know, on the motorway if you're falling asleep. Yeah, some of you are waking up when as I'm saying this very much. <laughs> you know, when you're in the motorway and you're driving, the, the, uh, the hard shoulder they've got. You know the white line on the hard shoulder, the paint on it, how have they made it? Made it bumpy. They made it bumpy. Why did they make it bumpy? To wake you up. To wake you up. <laughs> if I was a driver, I can tell. <laughs> All you guys are not answering, man. <laughs> it makes it bumpy. Why? Because when you go by, by that, when you, when you fall asleep or something, and <laughs> you wake up. <laughs> yeah, they've done it purposefully. The mu'min, the believer, when things go wrong in your life and you haven't sinned, if you haven't sinned, if you're not sinning, if you're doing like, if, if you're in minor sins, because we're not prophets, okay? Minor sins will, will now and again, it may, may occur. You're not a prophet. Only prophets are away from all sins. <clears throat> but if you're a believer and you've got minor sins, whatever, going on, and it's not something purposeful you're doing, what you will find is, you will find that when Allah gives you an affliction, you will know that it is for a reason and a hikmah. Naturally, your heart says that to you. But if you're a believer and you're getting things go happening in your life and you're questioning yourself, saying, what have I done wrong? And you know that there are certain things that you're doing wrong in your life, then this is a sign from Allah that bumpy... You know, that line is there to wake you up. It's a wake-up call. But you wake up. Are you following me, brothers? Yes, we do. When you go to a certain part in life, if things are not going right, if you're able to look, this is one scholar said this, and it's a beautiful thing. He was asked the question, when do you know that Allah is punishing you? And when do you know that Allah is just testing you? And when do you know that Allah is actually giving you a higher status in the next life uh, because of what He's putting you through? When do you know what is happening? How do we know that? You know, because everyone got problems. Is there anyone here that hasn't got a problem? Please put your hand up. No? But if you're sitting here and you think you don't have a problem, then you don't know what your problem is. <laughs> because you should be an insane person. That's what your problem is. There's only one person that can say that he has a problem. That is an insane person. Two people, my teacher, said, two people don't have a problem. One, an insane person. Because he doesn't even know what his problem is. <laughs> and the second one is a person who's dead. On the other side, and he's made it some way, he don't have no problem. Once he knows his past, all the situations, then he's got no problems. But apart from that, if you're alive, and if you've got your sanity, you have got problems around you. Now, when we've got problems around us, how do we know which situation we're in? What is Allah doing with us? Well, this scholar, a great scholar, Mufti Shafi, he said, he said that how you know this is that if when the problem arises, you are content in your heart. You have got no qualms in your heart. You are completely serene. Yes, the problem is there, but Alhamdulillah, You've got nothing coming out of your mouth as a complaint. Then he said, you should know that Allah Azawajal is testing you to give you a higher status. <coughs> or to just testing you as, as normal, so just testing you. If you actually at that time, you are pleased with the situation. That's how the Anbiya were. They were pleased, whatever condition. Then you should know that is rafur darajat. It's Allah is giving you lofty places in the next life. But if at that time you have complaints, complaints arising in your head and saying, "Why, why, what have I done? What's wrong? Why me? Why not that guy? Why have I been chosen for this musibah and, and difficulty?" Then you should know that is because one of your sins that you committed. That's why Allah has put you in this situation. Now what do you do in that situation? 
But in that situation, what we need to do is we need to revive ourselves because battery is low, yeah, petrol is low, tire pressure is low, whatever you want to say, it's low. You need to put it back up. But you don't put it back up just enough to get above the bar. You have to put it up, put it up, put it up until you get 200% if you can. If not, somewhere close to 100. That's when the Muslim functions properly. Because what happens to the Muslim, the believer is, that when he revives his Iman, there is some, at each stage, there is something different that will happen. At each stage of him reviving it, there's something different that will happen. And these are not making things up, brothers and sisters who are listening. These are from the books of, of our elders like Imam Ghazali. These are the books from our elders like Shah Waliullah Rahimullah. If you want to read their books, you will find out that the Iman has a certain power. At a certain power, it's going to do something different. At a certain power, it's going to do something different. Now, how can I explain that to you? Let me explain that to you with another example. Right? If you have got, if you have got a device, and that device, let's say for example, you want to you want to cook something, right? So basically, let's say let's say you want to create fire. So you create the fire of a candle. Is it the same power as you creating the fire on a cook, you know, the, uh, a cooker hose, or a, 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 a one of those, um, you know, you know what, what, the, the, the hobs, yeah. the actual hob itself? And having the candle, what's the what's the difference? Which one's stronger? Hob. The hob is stronger, right? Is it stronger that you cook something on the hob or you have the whole oven on? Oven on with gas throughout. Which one's stronger? The oven. Oven's gonna be stronger, right? Is it stronger that you have that or you have, let's say, for example, you know, you might have a whole furnace right is the furnace not stronger tell me yes and when they cremate a body what do they call that thing where they put the body in the cremation the, uh, the cremation. Yeah, there's a name for that no crematorium yeah. it's a crematorium the whole thing but anyway you know where they put the body in and they cremate the body and the thousand degrees that it goes to is that not hotter than anything else i've mentioned <coughs> you see it is right Yes. Because the heat and intensity inside that, that the crematorium or that, that place where they're burning the body and trying to burn into ashes, and the heat of your furnace, the heat of the oven, the heat of the hob, the heat of the candle, they're all five different heats. But they're all made of fire, yes or no? Yes. When fire increases, its intensity increases, you get a different power. Until you get to a power that you can, you can melt iron. Yes or no? Yes. Melt iron, which is very strong in its nature. You can get it to that degree. You can burn it so that it becomes liquid. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Allah Azza wa Jalla has given us Iman. The more powerful you make your Iman, the more of a strength you will see. It's going to be strength in everything. Strength in your thinking. Strength in your speech. Strength in your actions. Strength in the way you see Allah Azza wa Jal, meaning that the way you, 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 you uh, connect up with Him. Strength in the way you just read some, some, something and the, the, the vibrant, you know, uh, the, the, the electrifying sensation you get inside yourself. Is a different, there's a different sensation you will get depending on the power you give your Iman. You will understand? Yes. There's a power. In everything, the same thing. When you have a battery power, there's a, there's, a, there's a power in there. Then you get an extra battery. Maybe you get a Duracell or something. It's got a different power. Then you get a Duracell, you know, the, the, the uh, maybe triple X power, whatever it is. Then there's another power to that. Then forget that. You go to some next big battery, the D size, the A size, I don't know, whatever size. Right? There's a next power to that. Then you get the power of those things that can run whole machines. The batteries that run machines. There's a different power to that. You get the power of electricity. There's a power to that. You get a power of electricity of 120 volts. You get 240 volts. There's a different power. You get 1500 volts. It's going to be a different power. And so on and so forth. Each one has a different power and a different force it can pull. You can have the power to, to pull a remote control car from a normal battery. 
But that same battery is not going to pull a train, is it? <laughs> Guys, come on, a real train. It's not going to. You can get your Thornby train, you know, your Thomas Tank Engine train. You can pull that on your little device, but it's not going to pull a real train. The electricity power that needs to be generated to pull that train is something different. Now, Allah has given the believer the mechanism to make that power. And enough, so, such immense power the believer has got. But we need to discover that power. To discover that power, the, the root to that power is the first thing is the dhikr of Allah. The root to that is the dhikr of Allah. You know, when you get any sort of power in any of these devices, you've got to recharge the battery. If you want to recharge your iman, my brothers and my sisters who are listening, You've got to go through the mechanism of dhikr. What dhikr does is, now when you plug, let me give you an example. You just put, your, put the, uh, the wire inside the, inside the phone, right? And you keep on looking at it, second after second. You keep on looking at it. Why is it? Man, it's still 11%. Still 11%. What's wrong with it? 11%. You're getting annoyed. It's three minutes gone by now. It's only just about reaching 12%. You think, man, this is going to take all... Oh, it's so going to take an hour, two hours. I need you right now. I want to take my phone right now. My brothers, you know me, you know, I know that there's a certain time you've got to keep it on the power until it starts getting full charge. And it's got to be continuous power coming in. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. You can't take it off, put it back on, take it off, put it back. You can't do that. There is a power when you do dhikr just for a moment. And there's a power when you do dhikr with concentration of dhikr. You understand? There's a difference of the power, and you might not feel the power straight away. Just like you see it 11%, 11%, 12%, <laughs> there's not much going inside there. But you don't feel it. You don't feel it, but you don't know what's going on. Let me give you another example. Who's been the, who's been the air flying in a plane sometime in their life? Put your hands up. I guess everybody, right? It's everybody, right? Anyone here that's never flown in a plane? Never? Okay, so you'll all understand, yeah. So you're in a plane, and you're flying. You're flying in the air and it shows you you're this much altitude and it shows you you're going like something like 700 miles per hour. Yeah? yeah. Yes? yes? That's what it shows, isn't it? You're going 700 miles per hour and you look down and you see in certain small village, small people there, small tree. And you're going so slowly over that tree, you're thinking, I can't be going 700 miles per hour, right? <laughs> I don't look like 700 miles, that looks like 7 miles per hour. You know? You're going so slowly, you watch them like that, that little car there, the bridge there is moving so slowly. Why don't you realize it? Why don't you actually realize that you're going 700 miles per hour? Because you're high. You're so high. high. You're so high. You're so high. You don't realize where you are. When the believer is in dhikr, you can't see the power that's been generated inside you. You won't notice it. You're going to think I'm still in the same place. You won't notice it unless you were to put it into power and you put it into practice. I'm going to come to that in a minute. What I mean is that when you're in dhikr and your concentration with Allah Azza wa Jalla and you're connected with Him, the force and the power is to cut off from everything else. This is the real force of charging your, your battery and your power. The force is cutting off. Allah Azza wa Jal said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, he opened up Surah Muzammil. Ya ayyuhal Muzammil, O one who is wrapped up in my love, Stand up in the night except for a moment, except for a little moment. Sometimes, O oh Prophet, stand up half the night for me. Sometimes, stand up less than half the night for me. Sometimes, increase it for me. When you read for me, read in a slow rhythm, in a pace where you steadily read the Quran. وَرَطِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا إِنَّا سَنْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا This Quran has a heavy power inside it. You know when something has a heavy power inside it? 
Sometimes you have to take it in portions, you have to take it steadily. Something that is heavy, you have to take it steadily and that's when you absorb the real power of it. Allah says that the night time is the time, the best time for you to let for you to press your ego, to stamp your ego. Allah says, Allah says, in the daytime you you're naturally so busy. You're naturally so busy. Oh Prophet, you're so busy in the daytime, in the nighttime, cut off from everything else. In the nighttime, stand in front of me. In the nighttime, remember me. In the nighttime, take my name. And completely cut off everything that you've done in the daytime and completely be in my remembrance in the nighttime. This is real power. This is where Rasulullah said most of his power, where he used to generate his power from, was the tahajjud and qiyamun night. Yes, he was in the dhikr of Allah during the daytime. But there's a difference, there's a difference when you're with people, you're trying to remember Allah. When you're with people, you're trying to remember Allah. And when no one is bothering you and you're remembering Allah in the darkness, this is the real power of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam together. And subhanAllah, he's, he's, uh, when he used to stand up in the night time, he used to be dark. Now some, you know, um, we had Qiyamul Layl in the masjid where I am and I, used, I like to put the lights off. So one day, one gentleman grabbed me and he said to me, an elderly brother, he said to me, Imam sir, I think what you're doing is not right. It's very dark when you do your tahajjud. I said to him, very dark when I'm in tahajjud, I said, it's the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, how is it the sunnah? I said, let me tell you, Sayyidatuna Aisha radiallahu anha one night when she looked beside her bed place. It was her night with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wasn't there. He's in Sahih Muslim. So she got up and then she went into the masjid in search of the Prophet Sallallahu on her foes. And she carried on crawling, crawling until her hand touched the sole of the foot of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he's in sujood. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in the pitch. If he was like there, would she have been crawling like that and trying to find Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. But it was dark. <clears throat> And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Oh Aisha, do you think that on this night of yours I would actually go to another woman? As in my other wives, one of my other wives. Do you think I would do that? It's your night, I will be with you. But he was in prayer, it was, dark, it was darkness and he was in prayer. One thing was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had darkness. And there's a beauty in that because it makes you not be aware of anything. It makes you not be aware of anything around you. Second thing is that when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to charge his batteries at that time of the, of the night, and of course Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a high charge thing anyway, but he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Wa innahu la yughanu ala qalbi. He said, because he is all day in and out with some munafiqeen, hypocrites that are around him, sometimes he's got uh, kuffar or those who disbelieve around him, sometimes he's got the Jewish people, the Christian people, sometimes he's got the devil, you know, the people who worship the fire around him. All of this, it settles a dust on my heart. It settles a dust on my heart. Just like you can clean this part very nicely, you can come tomorrow, there might be a very thin layer of dust somewhere which you can wipe off again. No matter how much you clean, there's always something to clean after a day or two. That's why Rasulullah said, with all the daytime, his engagement, he used to have some kind of dust that settles on his heart. So what did he used to do? He used to recharge his battery just like we have to do that. But subhanAllah and Azim, Rasulullah is not like us, where we are low on our battery and we have to charge it high. No, he's already high and he's going to new levels. He's going to new levels. And his levels that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go to is closer and closer to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And at this time of the night, he used to recite the Qur'an with tartil. Now, brothers, listen to this carefully. The Qur'an is also a mechanism. It's a charger for, for our iman. The Qur'an will charge our iman when it's done properly. 
Like, you know, you get a charger, if you put it into the phone but you don't put it in properly, it's half stuck in bed. Is it going to charge your battery? No, it's not. You've got it in there. You say, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, it's in the phone. It's not going to charge it. If it's got very minor connection to it, maybe you might charge it a little bit on and off, on and off. You know, sometimes you've got a very faint connection to the phone, but it's not really in there, it's not out there. But it'll charge it, but maybe on and off, on and off. The same way the Qur'an, my brothers, my sisters, has been created with a certain way. Just as that charger needs to be there fully in locked into the phone, the same way the Qur'an has a mechanism. And that is Rattil al-Qur'an al If you recite the Qur'an and you want to just recite it by saying, you know, we've got, we've got, mashallah, we've got so many different huffal and so many different imams across the world. And if you recite the Qur'an and you recite it and say, you know, you know, you've got certain imams, Alif it's almost like you're in a jockey race. <laughs> and the only time you hear them, the only time you hear them uh, saying something you can understand is when they come to a long mud or something or end of an ayah. Now that type of Qur'an where he's jockey racing the Qur'an or the type of Qur'an where I'm going to read and he's just, just whizzing through the Qur'an. My brother, you're going to get an on and off charge from it. But to be honest with you and my sisters who are listening, that is not the way to charge the, charge the iman of the Qur'an. The Qur'an needs rhythmic stops. The Qur'an needs a steady read. The Qur'an requires us to read it slowly and steadily. Not too slow, but in a steady manner. So if you read the Qur'an in a way that you will find, and I'm telling you this, you will find there's a soothing element to it. When you listen to, I know, I know many of you listen to Qur'as from the world, yes or no? You know, you've got like Sheikh Sudeh, Surayn, you've got um, Sheikh... Um, or is it Mishari, you know, you've got uh, Sheikh Jibreel, and you've got so many different, you know, Shuyu around the world, right? Are they reading fast or are they reading in a steady manner? Steady. That's why you enjoy the Quran. I can guarantee none of you will take a CD from some of these places where they do the Quran really fast. Put that in your car and enjoy while you're driving it. You're not going to drive your car and listen to the guy saying, Are you going to enjoy having a nice drive and listening to that? Yes or no? Come on, brother, let's be honest with you. Why don't you enjoy that? Because it doesn't connect up with you. It doesn't connect up with your Iman. There's no connection with the Iman properly. How do we learn the Shaitan? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَى قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَى سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَى أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةٌ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ when you listen to that, is there a soothing to that? Yes or no? Yes. There's a soothing to Why? Because now you plugged in your Quran to your Iman properly. That's how the Quran is to be recited. The same way, my brothers, you know, five daily salahs, there's a connection that you can make with Allah, I can make with Allah properly, and there's one when you just like half connected, half not connected, bent connection, and you're trying to get your full charge power. So when I stand before Allah Azza wa Jal, if my mind is still in the dunya, if my mind is still in the world, I haven't disconnected from the world and connected with, with Allah Azza wa Jal. If I read my salah and I'm going to say, you know, <coughs> I'm reading it. Right? And I'm thinking about my salary. I'm still thinking about my workplace. Uh, what else? 
It's like automatic mode. Automatic mode. The car, when you've got cruise control, you know, cruise control, you put in cruise control, you don't have to bother about it. The same way, suddenly you wake up somewhere. First record, second record, second record, first record. Could it be first? Well, it has to be second because first record, I, talked to, I thought about my salary. <laughs> and when I got to Darlene, I was thinking about my workplace. And then I must have got blanked out, so if I'm standing now, it must be second rakat, right? That's how you work out your first rakat, second rakat. That's the only way you're going to work it out. There's no other way, because you were blanked out. You didn't even know whether you did three sujus or two sujus, but it's automatic, cruise control. You must have done two there. You know, it's cruise control. But the things where you get, where you get, you know, mixed up with is when you haven't sat down, you're supposed to stand up, you get mixed up in that. My brothers and sisters who are listening, when we pray and read and offer us a lot like this day in day out there's little charge of the iman that is happening do you understand that there's little charge of the iman if you want to charge it or properly you can charge it to the to the extent where subhanallah where just the two rakats a two rakats is enough to satisfy your heart when a big musibah affliction has come إذا حزبه أمر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هذا حديث about رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم in حديث مصحي مسلم when he used to be shook shaken up he was shaken up by a particular event affliction that arose رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم straight away stood up for two rakat salat whenever he was shaken up by something he stood up for salat even to the extent that the, when the wind in Medina was strong, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would get up straight away and pray two rakats salah. Now the power of those two rakats was such that when he would finish, subhanallah al whatever affliction he had, you know, he would be relieved from it. At least in the heart he would be relieved from it. There's a power of the believer. And the power of the believer is that nothing can go wrong. Power of the belief is nothing. I don't care if the building collapses. But still my Allah is with me. You know that connection with Allah? Allah hasn't done this to me because I have sinned. No. There are other matters I don't understand why Allah has done this. But there's nothing that I have done wrong in for this to happen. That's the kind of heart you have. Because if you look at the seed of the Prophet ﷺ, whenever things went wrong, whenever things went wrong, it wasn't it wasn't him saying that it's my fault. <coughs> it's our fault. Well, the only place you find that is in Surah, is, is in the Battle of Uhud. When the Sahaba let him, some Sahaba let him down. That's when Allah said, قُلْتُمْ أَنَّ هَذَا قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ You're saying, how did this happen? Say, it is from yourself. That's because they let themselves down, those certain Sahaba. Otherwise, Allah Azza wa Jal hasn't said that. Allah said, the believer, وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ if you are a believe, if you are believers, then you must be most supreme. You are most supreme if you are believers. You are on top of everything if you are believers. Now, coming back to the issue of salah and charging ourselves up, brothers, the way to charge ourselves up in salah is first, and a few things I want to say to you, and hopefully, inshallah, be in Allah, you will you will try and practice this. One of the things is to cut off from the world. There's a mechanism that the believer has. That he can cut off whenever he wants from the entire world. Even if your mother is in her deathbed. Even if your daughter has completely gone to hospital because she's in a coma. Even if it means that your stock markets have gone down and your whole business is completely finished. Allah Azza wa has given the heart of a believer. Once you connect with Allah, nothing can put you down. And even if you feel down for a little while, you put yourself back up really quickly. This is the power of belief. And that is a connection that needs to take place. That connection is that tabattal ilayhi tabtil, which is we've got to know how to completely cut off from everything else except for Allah. There's a mechanism that Allah has given us and we can do that. You know the way you go to work and you're completely in the computer, the screen, you're writing and your whole mind is in the computer. When you go, when you're driving, your whole mind is on driving. When you basically do something else, your whole mind is on there. Or most people, when they've got the phone, 
then they can't see anything else. They can't even see their wife. There's some husbands that got a form they can't even see their wife. It's really sad. There's some wives that can't see their husband. They're in the same house, in the same room. Both of them on their phones, doing whatever it is. They're not connecting with each other. That can happen. Yes or no, guys? Come on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it can happen. Some husbands and some wives, they only talk to each other through the phone. <laughs> <laughs> He's upstairs. She's downstairs. He texts her. It's just a text message. Bring me tea. <laughs> she texts back, how would you like it? Right? So texting, whatsapping while they're in the same house. You know, they don't, they've forgotten their communication, actually talking as, as human beings. But it happens. It happens, and I know it happens. Because I've seen it myself with individuals that are in the same environment, but they can't even see each other. When you keep your focus on something so much, you can be totally oblivious from the rest of your surroundings. Can it happen, yes or no? Yes. Some guys, they go to the toilet and they start dreaming. And suddenly, the only thing that wakes them up is the pain of sitting on the toilet seat so long. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not joking. Some people, some people, they can go to the toilet, they can sit there and they can suddenly wake up. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here, what am I doing here? I thought I was somewhere else. <laughs> and when you don't realize what's wrong with you, seriously, you know, if we don't, you know, if you're in the same thing again, let me, let me share something with you, yeah? Let me share something with you. <coughs> now, have you ever, I'm sure it's happened to us once or twice in our lives, sometimes in our lives, like, you sat in the toilet, and you did your business. And when you first started your business, it smelled a bit bad. But after a while, it didn't bother you. So even when you got off and you did your stinja and you finished you were washing your hands, it's completely a normal room. And then what happens is that you open the door, you go out, and you left the toilet, you're just normal. And then you forgot your watch that you left on the sink, by the sink, so you go back into the toilet to go and get your watch, watch and you walk in that, oh, 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 man, was I in there a few seconds ago? You know why I'm giving you the example, brothers? Some people, they're in this dunya, and the whole dunya, the smell of it is all around them. And they don't realize how bad the smell is, how much thick they are in, in the dunya, in the world. Until one day, may Allah forbid, they wake up too late. They go to the akhir. There's no way they can walk back in, but they will see the stench of the dunya when they have walked out of the out of the dunya. They've gone to the akhir. My brothers, let it not be too late for us for us to realize this. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to demonstrate for you. I'm going to demonstrate for you what you can do as believers. I'm going to demonstrate for you what you can do as believers. And you probably never knew that you had this power inside you. The power of iman is very strong until you recognize what kind of iman power you've got. Let me give you an example. Um, my, in my um, academy, Safar Academy in um, North London, I'm going to give you a couple of, couple of examples and then I'm going to give you a demonstration with yourself. So bear with me. I taught the kids <coughs> how to do concentration of Salah. So we did this over six weeks, a six weeks program. I'll give you a quick demonstration of it today. I taught them how to do concentration of Salah and they learnt it and every week it was getting more and more better. When, when you ask any person what's your concentration in Salah, they will tell you, if, you, if I catch any of you right now and I ask you, what's your concentration for the last month or for today, most likely you will tell me between 5 to 25%. You will not go above that. Most people, most people out of that will be about 5% concentration in the Salah. And it starts out like that because we don't realize where we are. We're just so much in, you know, drenched in our own lifestyle and what's going on outside that we bring the whole of the dunya inside our akhir as well, inside our Salah as well. Then what happened is that after a week or two weeks, we, we started a massive chart on the wall. We start to measure people's, you know, people's salah and make a stick graph and see how they're going up and up in terms of their concentration. Within a couple of weeks, I had all of them 
going towards 40, 50 percent average concentration the whole week. So they had to go home, they had to make, give us themselves a percentage for Maghrib, percentage for Isha, percentage for Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, and give an overall average for the whole percentage of the whole day. And then an overall average like this for the whole week and bring me the average of the week to me by the end of the week on the weekend. And then we would mark that on the chart and then we would see next week how they're doing. Okay? Believe me, these are 13 year olds, 14 year olds, 15 year olds. And after the fourth, third or fourth week, I'm asking them, how do you feel towards your salah? The same kids who were reading Have you seen kids read? Up, down, up, down. Fast as you can get it done. Because my game time is going. <laughs> Fast as you can get it. Soon as the salam is gone done, they'll remove control. <laughs> so the same kids that were doing that, and don't forget, some adults do the same thing as well. <laughs> they start to blame the kids. So same kids, now, when, when I made them do salah, I asked them, I said to them, how are you finding your salah? They said, one of them said, and there's a few of them said this, but one of them said, sir, he said, I enjoy salah. <coughs> one of them said to me, sir, I, the best part, there's, there's a couple of them said this, particularly, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from them, it's not, I'm not making this up for you. I said, how are you finding your salah? So a couple of them said that the best portion of salah is when we go into sujood we don't feel like coming up from sujood <laughs> then I started to ask this is in London my friends and this is just a couple just a few years back maybe about five years back something I did this whole demonstration uh, there's, there's this, this whole pattern that can be repeated I would love some of you to do this inside this masjid as well now, what I wanted to see, you know the power of Iman. Remember I said to you, there's a power, there's a charge of Iman. When you charge it up good and proper, you go beyond this enjoyment, you start seeing, you will see karama, you will see a miracle in your life. And I was waiting for that. I was waiting for these kids to say to me that there's something unusual, that unexpected happened to me. So I'm asking every week, I'm saying, anyone notice anything unusual? <coughs> So after about the fourth or fifth week, one of the kids said, he said, sir, he said, when I normally go to school, it takes me 25 minutes to get there. I was home, I was having my breakfast, I knew I was late. I knew I was late because it was already something like, uh, 8.27, by the time I get out, it's going to be like 8.33 or 30, 30.37, I think it was. So he had to walk fast, and he knew that day he's going to turn up late, but he'll give an excuse. So he left about 8.37 from his house, and he's walking briskly towards his school. He said, so, he said, when I reached the school, he said, the same watch that was 8.37 at my house, Normally it takes me 25 minutes to get to my school. When I got there, the watch was telling me it's 8.39. Two minutes had gone by. He said, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. This is what you will see. The power of the Iman will make you see a karama. And I'm telling you, ordinary people. I'm not telling you, you have to be a person, you know, on a musallah flying in the air, right? <laughs> doing a Baghdadi style, right? Twirls in the, in the air, magic carpet. I'm not telling you, you have to do all that. Walk on water and tell the whole world what kind of powers of God. I'm not talking about that. Guys, please. You don't have to be known as a big budruk and a wali and someone who's so big, you know that people are going to just admire you when you walk in. No, you're going to be the most common person. But when you put your charge and your power to it, you will see something come out of it. But you have to take yourself to that power. Then I carried and asked him. And then one of them said, on the fifth week, I think it was, he said, sir, he said, I went home. Now, this is a, this is a 13 year old. He said, sir, I went home and I told this to my brother. And I said to him, to my brother, that, Ustad said in the madrasa, he said, if you pray two rakats to Allah, whatever you want from Allah, Allah will give it to you. This is what I said to him, just the belief. You want Allah to do it, Allah will do it for you. 
So he said, I was talking to my younger brother. Now his younger brother is nine years old. You know, the younger you get, the more innocent you get. Because they literally believe in it. It's not, it's not like me and you. We have, okay, maybe uh, there's this possibility, coincidence, circumstance. We bring all these words out. But the little kid, nine-year-old, he, he's not believing it. He said, yeah. He said that? Yeah, okay, good. So I said, what happened? He said, well, you know, before when our PlayStation used to break, or not work, when our PlayStation was not working, he said, we used to smack it a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and then it used to work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So, but now what he does is, he, now at home, whenever it doesn't work, he says, step aside, I'm praying two rakats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and he goes, when he prays his two rakats, he comes back, Puts it on and it works. Every time he's done his two records, it works. I said, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> then the sixth week came. And I said, you know, tell us, tell me, how you feeling? How's your salah? How's your week? How's this? Anything, any stories about So the same boy spoke up again. His name was Abdul Hakim. He said, sir, he said, something strange happened this week. I said, what? He said, when we were, he said, me and my mother, my family, we went. We went to the local shopping center. We parked the car inside the shopping center. And it was, you know, the car park, the multi-story car park. They were in there and my mother had to get something out of the boot and she got it out and she closed the boot but then she realized that she had left the keys inside the boot and the whole car's locked. So now she's thinking, who's she gonna call? She doesn't know around to break the window. She doesn't gonna, she can't you know, get inside. What's she gonna do? He said, my younger brother said, don't worry, I'm going to pray two rakats. <laughs> she said, what? You can pray? He said, yes. He prayed two rakats in the car park, in the multi-story car park, next to the car park. And then he went up to the boot, he put his hand to the boot, and the boot just opened. <laughs> now this is a kid who's nine-year-old in London, <coughs> who exercised this thing of salah, this battery charge that Allah Azza wa has given us. You tried, my brother. I'm telling you, any of you guys tried. Any of you put your belief and you charge your battery. How do you charge? Are you tell me how do you charge your battery? How you charge your battery is that you've got to cut yourself from everything else and just think of Allah <coughs> there's a big power in that. So let's try. Let's try this. And where you are, I want you to sit comfortably. And sit comfortably. Everyone sit nice and comfortable. Right? Nice and comfortable. Anyone got any phones? Please put your phones in silent, put it on, put switch it off, whatever you have to do, do that. I don't want to hear any phones now. Right, I'll give you a quick demonstration. Now, today I can't do a six weeks with you. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the basics that I gave them. I want you to use these basics again and again. I want you to practice this. You will see the power coming from it as you, as you practice it. So now, what you do is, I want you to, when I tell you, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, not now. And I want you to just think that Allah is watching you. Allah is watching me. Allah is watching me. Allah sees me. Allah hears me. Allah is watching me. Allah knows me. Allah is seeing me. Allah is watching me. Allah is seeing me. Allah is watching me. Allah is seeing me. Allah is seeing me. Just that thought. And when your concentration breaks from that, then I just want you to simply open your eyes. And I'm going to see how long you can keep your concentration going on. Just purely that Allah is seeing me, Allah is watching me, Allah is there hearing me, Allah is seeing me, Allah is watching me. That's all you have to do. Are you ready for this? Yes? Yep. Okay. After three. Everyone get comfortable. After three. One, two, three.
Okay, that's enough open your eyes. Open your eyes. Right. That was about two minutes. <laughs> uh, roughly two minutes. What that shows is that for two minutes we were able to do it. What we're gonna do now is hopefully you've all got your wudu still with you. You're going to all stand up when I tell you, and you're going to do the same thing while standing up. And then you're going to do the same thing while just going to ruku, and the same thing while in sujood, the same thing while in tahiyya. Just it's going to take another minute or so. Right? This is an exercise we're doing just trying to get that concentration. That tabat talilehi tabtida. Right? So I'm going to ask you all to please stand up in your lines. What's up? <coughs> Stand somewhere where you can clearly do your salute. You can clearly do your salute. Right? When you stand up, you want to be comfortable. And again, all you're going to do is you're going to you come forward if you want. You're going to simply when I tell you, you're going to close your eyes and you're just going to think Allah is watching me, Allah is seeing me, Allah sees me, Allah watches me, Allah is watching me right now, Allah is seeing me right now. That's all you have to do. Right? One, two, three. Now I can have everyone going to Ruku, going to Ruku. And again, just think Allah is watching me, Allah sees me, Allah hears me. Now you stand up. And I want you to go into sujood, go into sujood. Again, same thing is that Allah is hearing me, Allah is watching me, so bring that in your mind. Now sit down. While you're in a tahiyya position, you think Allah is seeing me, Allah is hearing me, Allah is watching me. That's it. If you look at me now, look at me now, the rest of this phone that is pretty One thing is when you do this, you can see already, am I right or not right, that already you are feeling a bit calm inside. Yes or no? Yes. 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 yes or no? Dhikr brings a calmness, a sukoon, a tamanina, a thing inside you that nothing else does. Now one thing is, I don't you know, I, w I want you to bring this in your mind. Don't say it with me. And, you know, people are going to say, Bida, Bida, Sheikh, Bida, Bida, Bida. And make it stand up like that. Think of Allah, Bida, Bida. Whatever Bida you want to talk about, yeah, I'm not going to hear that right now. I want you to bring this in your mind as I'm, uh, as I'm saying this. Just bring it in your mind. La ilaha time to do this with you. But when you do your salah, before you do your salah, you want extra concentration. All you need to do is before you do your salah, just a few times in your head, in your mind, or if you're in your house, you can do it loudly like I did it. Just bring la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah La ilaha illallah Bring that in your mind. Calm yourself down. You ready? We're going to act upon a hadith now. The hadith is, and I want you to get it right now, first time round. The shahadan is going to come soon. You've got to get this ready first time round. <coughs> I want you to make the intention right now. Allah is watching me, Allah is seeing me. You're going to carry on that. So you're going to carry that on from takbir all the way to taslim. 
from saying Allah over to the Sanat. You're going to pray two rakats nafa. What are you going to pray? Two rakats nafa. And everyone's going to do it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, according to Sahih Hadith al Bukhari, whosoever does his wudu and he does his wudu properly, and then he prays his two rakats, prays two rakats, in which he does not think about anyone other than Allah. His heart does not turn to any other than Allah. Then that person has entered Jannah. That person has entered Jannah. Jannah becomes 